Uh, all right, so I'm going to invite us back. And um, one point, I want to make a few points, and then I'm going to provide you with a few minutes of, uh, deep, to debrief and have some discussion. Um, <clears throat> everyone say the Negro Act of South Carolina, and I'm, I'm sharing, this is from South Carolina, and yet every colony then state um, had laws like this. And so um, there's the exclusivity and structuring of policies, statutes, um, laws in favor of creating stability amongst and within the white race, psychological stability, physical stability, emotional stability. This, that's what the, those are the premises that this country uh, is being built upon. And, and then there is the, not only the decimation of rights for black people, but the deconstruction of our humanity, the, the debilitation process. Does that make sense? Um, and so what I want to compel you all to think about um, is anti-blackness in the terms of not just the uh, institution of slavery and uh, locating black people within the forced uh, labor uh, construct, but also, in addition uh, to that, the deconstruction of black humanity. Disrupting a group so much, intentionally, violently disrupting a group of people so much that they can't function to build a healthy community amongst them within each other, psychologically, emotionally, et cetera. Uh, when you have children and you parent, and W.E.B. Du Bois talks about this in Black Reconstruction, he says that black uh, families, black parents could not control their children. Uh, that was left up to uh, white people, the, the owners essentially of these black people. Um, and so the, there's, a, there's psychological, emotional disruption. And again, this example I'm going to share with you emphasize, emphasizes uh, color, that color uh, variable that I was uh, discussing prior to break. It says, I'm going to read this out to you. The Act of 1740 declares all Negroes and Indians to be slaves. Free Indians in amity with this government, Negroes, mulattoes, and mestizos who are now free, accepted. So if you're already free uh, in this colony at this time during this period, you're accepted, you're free. But from this point on, all Negroes and Indians entering into this colony or being born into it are going to be enslaved. Section two, under this provision, <laughs> turn to your table mates and say, under this provision, <laughs> okay, has something special in store here. Under this provision, it has been uniformly held that color is prima facie evidence. Go ahead and uh, get your phones. For those of you that have cell phones. <laughs> And I want you to Google prima facie, P-R-I-M-A, one word, second word, facie, F-A-C-I-E. You stood up first. What does it mean? Sarah? Okay, I'm sorry, sorry. Nice to meet you, Sarah. What does it mean? What'd you come up with? Okay, you all got that? So, so color is prima facie evidence as to, to in terms of determining who uh, is to be enslaved and who isn't? Turn to one person at your table and say, if you look like a Negro. If you look like, say, say it again, an Indian. However, everyone say however. Okay. Since color is prima facie evidence, the party bearing the color of a Negro, mulatto, or mestizo is a slave. But the same prima facie result does not follow from the Indian color. So if you look like an Indian, you can get away with passing for an Indian or a white person, you're free. But if you look like you have any black, turn to your, your table and say, if you look like you have any African descent, you are to be enslaved. And so what this means is that because you're black, and this is our whole experience in this country, you are automatically coming from a deficit-based orientation. You're automatically presumed guilty. We automatically assume 
that what you say is worth less than any other person, essentially. It's worth less than other people of color. It's worth much less than what white people have to say. So how many of you as, a, as black people, black and brown people in here, in this room who may be mixed with black or you uh, come from a predominantly uh, traditional black experience, you've been in rooms as a professional or as a student, and you've made a point. You've offered something, you've attempted to contribute, and people in the room acted like they didn't know what you were talking about, and yet someone else made the same point, and they took it. It's like, oh, I get it now. If you've had that experience, go ahead and stand up. All of the time, okay? Just keep standing, keep standing. It's not you. It's the way that people have been otherized to devalue your humanity. They have much less respect for it. They can't hear it when it comes out. They don't appreciate even the way that you express your tone of voice, your emotions that may come with it. And yet, Billy or Timmy or Becky or Susie or Rebecca, who is white or white presenting, they can say it or say it in, on terms that we've been socialized to accept and embrace, valued right instantaneously, right? So you can go ahead and have a seat. And remember that it's not you. And I say that in my book. Um, it's the fact that you're black. And so if you're black, we automatically value you less. And so anti-blackness, which I define quite extensively in my book, is a white American legal, social, cultural, economic, institutional value and belief system. It involves the deprioritization. Everyone say deprioritization. Of humans lab labeled and or perceived as black people, as well as the criminalization, hyper-negativity, hyper-scrutiny, and negative positioning of black people and or blackness throughout all aspects of American life. So I want you to uh, choose a partner uh, from another table. I'm going to have you get up and, and go meet someone that else that you uh, har are hardly familiar with. Um, and I want you to discuss the second question. In what ways do these legal, so socio, and psychosocial conditions shape white culture and white people's relationships with and attitudes towards black people just during the period that we've discussed, okay? The other thing that I want to amplify and highlight, though, is this, this also constitutes the ways that Indians deal with black people, that uh, Asian people, when they begin to immigrate into this country in the 19th century, that they begin to deal with black people. Uh, this anti-black orientation constitutes the, the ways in which black people deal with black people. So much that some of us in here would probably uh, be entirely against all the black people coming together and having lunch together because we would feel as though people would be looking at us or observing, oh my goodness, why are they uh, going all to themselves, right? Um, and, and we're fine with black men, particularly heterosexual, masculine, emoting black men, as long as they are subservient and do not emote uh, any type of confidence that goes beyond the bounds of what white people are, or people who have a white orientation are comfortable with. We're fine with it. Um, and the same can be said about how we deal with uh, gender issues as well. Um, so go ahead and find a partner from another table and discuss that second question. I'll give you about two to three minutes. All right, um, so let's hear from two people. I actually didn't get the opportunity to discuss, but I was listening uh, this entire time about uh, what's been standing out and what has resonated in regards to some of these things that are that they're brought forth. So I don't know why I'm why am I nervous? Can you tell me why I'm nervous right now? Yes, it's called stereotype threat. <laughs> um, just in the um, perception of how you know uh, the the culture as it relates to slaves and and going back to the um, rice plantation where it was the slaves that taught the actual owners how to do this how to make money 
but it was their wealth, meaning the, the owners of the slaves, that, you know, took that upon themselves and made their families richer on the backs of their slaves. Yes. But it, was, but it wasn't them. So time and time again, it was stepping on the backs of these people to get higher and higher and pushing them further and further down. Yes. So that was one of the most powerful things he, that he happened to mention that resonates with me as well. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And, and in that detail, for whoever uh, raised that up, is the, this dynamic that we deal with people of color uh, in or, or through which is uh, the dynamic of commodification and exploitation. This is why black people were brought here, to be exploited. And so that is the cultural relationship that exists uh, between whites and blacks and every other uh, racial ethnic group who is here, who is not located uh, within the white organizational framework. And so we have a relationship. Everyone say we have a relationship of exploitation as it pertains to uh, black people. Some people are like, I'm not saying that. Why not? It's true. All right. Um, and I don't say that lightly. Let's hear from one other person, the gentleman in the blue shirt that's sitting down uh, back at the back table. Yes. So what I took away from this is um, it's a lot of work that has went into us getting where we're at now. Um, you know, as, we, as you go through the history of how we got to this point in this country, uh, you know, questions do come up in my mind about, you know, what is it going to take to kind of undo some of this stuff? Yeah, wow, that's powerful. That's so powerful, thank you very much. Um, and I want all of you who are familiar with, with just certain aspects of our history and the ways that um, whites at times have joined with, with black people and other groups to try to fight against or to establish certain uh, social justice movements or anti-racism movements. They've always been met with substantial white resistance from the predominant uh, facet of, of the white race. Uh, because this country was founded on principles of whiteness and white supremacy. And so there is a need to protect that. So many times we think that, oh, we're doing justice-oriented work or, oh, we're doing racial equity. We have a whole swath of people who could care less about racial equity. And I want you to think about it from their perspective. Why would people want to lose their status and their place or placement in the society when all of it, not a little bit of it, all of it rests upon and has been built upon your dehumanization in, in putting you down. If, if I lose that, and Toni Morrison says it best, what else do I have? So I want you to think about that as we transition into this next piece. Um, so go ahead, you can thank your partner. You can go back to your tables. So again, we, we have the kind of the origins that I've shared uh, some slide examples uh, of with you. Now I'm going to uh, emphasize just briefly the ways that this sociocultural, psychosocial orientation um, emerged and was reinforced through white American academic institutions. And so you've got uh, academic scholars. Turn to your, your table, your neighbors at your table and say, we've got academic scholars, scientific philosophers who are encouraged to go through white American academic institutions and develop philosophies that prove and reinforce black inferiority. Turn to just one other person at your table and say, it's proven. It's scientific. And these same research methods and hypotheses are here today with us, the effects and the ramifications of them. So Dr. Charles Caldwell, who went to the University of Pennsylvania, he says that 
black people's uh, skulls had less, less bumps. They suggested less bumps. And so that was rationale that, <laughs> it's just, it's humorous. Uh, that was justification uh, to prove that the, the reason that we, why, of why we needed to, to be enslaved, of why we needed masters, is because through his observations, uh, we, we, our brains just had less bumps on them. So that was one reason. So write that down, less bumps on the brain. Uh, and then Thomas Jefferson, he comes along. He also uh, produces philosophies and literature that people call upon to prove their uh, theories. He says that, I advance it, therefore, as a suspicion only that the blacks, whether originally a distinct race or made distinct by time and circumstances, are inferior to the whites in the endowments both of body and mind. Turn to your neighbor and say, you can't argue with that. The, the president said it. Turn to your neighbor and say, the president said it. And no, not Trump, Jefferson. Okay. So, um, go through these. I'm actually going to click through here. Uh, Dr. John Benevry, another uh, profound, uh, renowned doctor. He says, God has made the Negro an inferior being. Not in most cases, but in all cases. Turn to your neighbor and say, but in all cases. But white men is equal, right? And so this, these philosophies uh, continue to build upon each other. They, they work, are working in concert with each other to train a whole culture of people to be trained and conditioned as sociopaths towards black people. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is crazy. Okay. So it's not only religious, it's academic, right? Uh, I'm going to go past this. Uh, Cart Cartwright is who I'm trying to get to. Yes, Cartwright says, and he, he coins the term diesthesia ethiopica. They're lazy. They have a lack of work ethic. And it's a, he, he coins it and frames it through <laughs> as a behavioral illness. It's a mental illness. Right? Turn to your, your neighbor and say, it's proven. Through legal principle? Say, say this one, through legal principle? Through scientific principle? By scholars, these are the best. These represent the best of America, okay? Um, so he, he says that as a part of keeping us in our uh, required or the preferred state of submission, just amputate their toes. <laughs> and this is white Western world medical philosophy. Beat them. University of Pennsylvania again. It is the red vital blood sent to the brain that liberates their minds when under the white man's control. More blood flows to our brain when we're controlled by white people. And it is the one of sufficiency of red vital blood that changed their minds to ignorance and barbarism when in freedom. He becomes known as the expert in Negro medicine. Turn to your neighbor and say, he's the expert. Did you know? Uh, we have another president, President Andrew Johnson. He's actually Lincoln's successor. He says, if blacks were given the right to vote, that would place every splay-footed, bandy-shanked, humpback, thick-lipped, flat-nosed, woolly-headed, ebon-colored Negro in the country upon an equality with the poor white man. As long as I am president, this will be a country for white men and a government for white men. Turn to your neighbor and say, this it has been practiced and practiced, and practiced, and practiced, so much so to the point that you made. You said, well, what can we do to start undoing this? You have to create an entirely different psychological and cultural landscape. There are no policies that are going to 
shift or change these dynamics enough for black people and, and brown people's humanity to be regarded in the same ways that we regard white humanity in this culture? And that is what is so unfortunate about this. So let me go on, just give a few more, and then we're going to transition. Polygenism, Dr. Josiah Knott. He says that the, the uh, black people's skulls, because they were uh, formed differently than white people based on his observations, that we were uh, inferior and that enslavement, again, was our rightful place. This is another phrenological science. Uh, he, he and others create charts. Um, uh, these are the, everyone said, <laughs> Orson Fowler, Samuel Wells. How many of you are familiar with their work? No? The, write, write this down. These are the experts on good character. How to determine good character. And it goes so deep that they uh, create or launch the Fowler and Wells Company, uh, and they become recognized as the leaders in how to read character. So they produce these phrenological journals, um, different books, and they establish the science, everyone say the science, of physiognomy. So physiognomy is a practice of assessing a person's character, a personality from their outer appearance, especially the face. So all you have to do is look at people and you can tell how intellectually and developmentally inclined they are. Bearing in mind, then, its limitations and modifications, it is well in all cases when making a physiognomical examination to observe the facial angle. Figure 142 will help to convey an idea of different grades of development and intelligence as indicated in the profile size as well as form being taken into the account. Have a brief conversation amongst them within your table groups. What do you see? This is, remember, this is a science. This is scientific. What, what do you see here in terms of who's most intelligent versus who's least intelligent? So varying grades of intelligence. <laughs> There's so much more I could say to this. Please, if you're interested, take, sign up for my two-day course. <laughs> uh, but President, every, turn to your, your neighbor and say, you know what Lincoln said? Lincoln said, I will say then that I am not nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races, that I am not nor ever have been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor qualifying them to hold office, nor to intermarry with white people. And I will say, in addition to this, that there is a physical difference. Turn to your neighbor and say, there's a physical difference this unrelenting preoccupation with the way that they look. It just constitutes that they are the most inferior. And one of the things that I appreciate about Joe Fagan's work is he talks about, out of all the anti-others, he talks about the anti-sentiments in America, the anti-Asian sentiment, the anti-Latinx or uh, Latino uh, sentiment. He, but he, he says, and he admits this, that the anti-Black sentiment is the strongest. It's the strongest. And essentially because we as black people, we know it, we feel it. Um, so I'm going to give a few more examples. Uh, and, and this is going to be very deep, right? Because when you can, um, get people to believe and build a culture and establish foundations that these people are in fear, you can do whatever you want. So when it comes to rape, and sexual assault, you have judges, I'm just going to read this briefly, that, that rule that black women can't be raped. Okay? Cecilia, um, a young black girl who had been acquired by a master at eight years old, he begins raping her somewhere in her early preteens or, or teens. And he impregnates her three times. She has the baby by him. She finally has enough because he continues raping her through her third pregnancy, and she says no more. She tries to solicit help from his daughters. They don't help. So she threatens him. She says, I'm going to murder you. I'm going to kill you if you come near me. He goes near her once more. She murders him. 
But the judge, in deciding her case, this is what he said to the jury. He says, if Newsom was in the habit, I'm going to exchange some words here. If Newsom was in the habit of raping the defendant, who was his slave and went to her cabin on the night he was killed to have to rape her or for any other purpose. And while standing in the uh, floor talking to her, she struck him with the stick, which was a dangerous weapon, and knocked him down and struck him again after he fell and killed him by either blow. It's murder in the first degree. But turn to your neighbor and say, the rape is not illegal. Turn to your neighbor and say, the rape is not the issue. The fact that she defended herself. So it's interesting because it's, it's indicative of all the ways that as BIPOC people were forced to accept anti-blackness, we're forced to accept racism on a daily basis. And the minute we mention it, the minute we get angry, the minute we have a reaction, that becomes the, the problem. Um, this next example, George D. State, Mississippi, this, the Mississippi Supreme Court ruled in 1859, after a black male slave had already been convicted for rape of a nine-year-old girl, that, in essence, the, the black girl couldn't be raped. They said that, they concluded that the male slave could only commit a rape upon a white woman. They were very uh, direct in their ruling. And so the, the actual transcript and the, 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 the decision that was rendered um, read, the crime of rape does not exist in this state between African slaves. Our laws recognize no marital status as between slaves, their sexual intercourse is left to be regulated by their owners. The regulations of law as to the white race on the subject of sexual intercourse do not and cannot for obvious reasons apply to slaves. Their intercourse is promiscuous and the violation of a female slave by a male slave would be a mere assault and battery. So the rape of black women and girls by white or black men was legal. Indictments, of, some, indictments were sometimes dismissed for failing to allege that the victim was white. In those states where it was legal for white men to rape white women, statutes uh, provided less severe penalties for the convicted white rapist than for the convicted black one. In addition, common law rules both uh, defined rape narrowly and made a, dif a difficult crime to prove. During slavery then, the legal system treated Seriously, only one racial combination, rape involving a black offender and a white victim. This selective recognition continued long after slavery ended. And so you can go to cases such as the, in 1899, this is 34 years after supposed emancipation. And the Georgia Supreme Court rules that uh, black men uh, are, because black men are black, actually black, that informs our intent to rape. That blackness informs one's intent. Uh, to rape. The Florida Supreme Court uh, basically said that because black women were immoral, they, they couldn't be raped. And so this very long, contentious, cultural variable that we've been dealing with and that we continue to deal with, it shows up in a variety of ways, so much so that I can't even unveil or go through all of them today. But as, you, as, as I close this portion and as we I have a few minutes to debrief, I want you to think about um, the magnitude of the, these historical elements and how persistent um, these conditions uh, have been and, and what we've inherited uh, as a culture of American people in terms of white supremacy, white superiority, our deference to it, and also anti-blackness and really the extremities of that. So I want you to just jot down very quickly on your uh, index card, what, what's one takeaway uh, that you have from just this initial portion of us examining this together? Uh, is there anyone uh, who would like to share what they wrote? Just one takeaway, we'll hear from one person. Hi, I'm Maggie. Um, I think that if we think of ourselves as an educational institution, one of the best things that we take from an education is the ability to think critically. And yet all of the, all of the structures that have been put in place in terms of law, religion, first impressions, they've categorically just excused any white person from having to think critically, yeah. that they have not had to engage on that. And then when we think about it as being the, the systems in place, law state, 
they have made it easy for the individual. So when we think about ourselves as a system and as an organization, we have to think about how do we put the, um, the onus or the responsibility back on the individual to yes. make that critical decision. Yeah, what is your name? Maggie. Thank you very okay. much, Maggie. We can give Maggie a hand too. Um, and and I, I emphasize that that's where the majority or what the, the bulk of my work emphasizes is that there are people, all of us are behind these decisions that get made within these institutions. And yet one way to uh, excuse ourselves, excuse um, unacceptable actions, decisions, is to talk about structure. It's systemic. It's the system. It's the institutions, not the people. <laughs> Turn to your, your partner and say, I don't have to take any <laughs> responsibility. Because it's the system. <laughs> right? And so to Maggie's point, we have to understand it and hold each other accountable. Like, hey, Aaron, I really appreciate you. We can hang out. We can be friends. But the decisions that you're making or that, that we've agreed upon or that you may have had racist impacts. And I, I understand that you had good intentions. You consider yourself to be a great person. Um, and yet, I've lost out on the last seven jobs that I've applied for. I can't get promoted. Does that make sense? So um, thank you so much for that. So everyone uh, refer to these packets. We're going to transition. Everyone do this. <laughs> Okay, we're going to actually transition into another uh, component of this. And so when we talk about, when we talk about um, anti-racism, what, like, what does that mean? What does racial equity, in essence, mean? And, and whose vantage point are we coming from? Are we coming from this collective uh, nature or idea like that we're all, or presumption, presumptuous place that we're all coming from the same place or vantage point with the same intentions. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the, this is the course that I teach the UCSF if anyone wants to, to sign up for it. Um, so there's a two-day course and then there's also a 12-week series that I'm teaching. Um, both are through Zoom, so it's every Tuesday from 1 to 4 if you want to join. It starts actually Tuesday next week. Um, and then there's a leadership fellow, a uh, leaders fellowship. Uh, but anti-racism uh, encompasses balancing and shifting Eurocentricity white male imperialist patriarchal supremacy in the ways that we think, the ways that we uh, come to situations, and so on and so forth. Um, the, uh, power, privilege, and anti-blackness worldwide. These modes of privilege function as setting the dominant social, political, legal, policy-oriented, and cultural norms around the world. Racial equity means acknowledging explicit and implicit affirmative actions for white people, historical and perpetual, and groups with privilege related to skin color, which were created systematically through institutional power, dominance, and control. Uh, the goal of racial equity is to promote consistent and sustained repair for non-white, non-Eurocentric communities and communities that continue to experience racial harm due to racism and caste based upon colorism. Lastly, racial equity includes authentic and intersectional racial, ethnic, and or color demographic representation that promotes sustained and consistent participation of people from oppressed communities based on skin color, primarily black people. Um, so if you refer to these handouts, um, I want you to read through the first one, spend a few minutes skimming, and, and the second one uh, together. These outline and define a landscape of considerations around addressing, understanding and addressing anti-racism organizational development and or change. So I'm going to walk you through uh, an activity once you've had an opportunity to review this, or review both. I'll give these instructions again. If you have finished reading, go ahead and locate the third handout in your packet. And it has an array, uh, it has the four different types of organizations listed in different internal operational functions that most organizations uh, have. It's coming from the frame of nonprofit. Uh, but the four that I want you to pay attention to are decision-making, budget, 
power and pay in culture. And what I uh, am going to invite you to do at this time is skim those four areas. And based on what you just read about the different types of organizational characteristics from the other two resources, I want you to rate and, and rank or circle um, where you believe your organization fits in terms of that, that particular operational uh, area or function, okay? And if you finished making your selections on, on the paper, I want you to type this oev.com slash Dante King 893 into your browser and respond uh, to this poll for the area of decision making only. We'll continue with this after lunch. We're going to transition to lunch, but I want you to want you to consider a few variables. What are you taking away from from me having you do this, like what's one thing that, that you're taking away? You can stand up, speak loudly. You can pass. Anyone want to share? Alejandro. Thank you. Um, I, I think for me, looking at this, is that we have all of these organizations within UCSF. So some of them are definitely, you know, at the top, and you know that's where some of the resources are. Um, I would say for the ODO, I would say we're at the bottom, but you know, the piece about the resources, you know, we don't have always the control and access to those. So I think you have all of this within a large UCSF, and I think there is an evolution to go from A through D, and there is the eagerness and the political correctness around wanting to be an anti-racist, but I think some of them have the journey to, to get to at least to a multicultural before they could even be an anti-racist. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Thank you, Alejandra. Let's, let's give her a hand. I actually agree with that personally. The other thing I want to amplify is that um, it's important to recognize that there are, are, are breakdowns within the organizational structure. So you might be, you might believe, or and you may, may even be functioning as an anti-racist organization as it pertains to representation, right? But in terms of people's experiences, whose voices are heard, how decisions are being made. Um, and who out vocalizes who, um, you may be the all-white club. Does that make sense? So it's important to understand that in uh, coming to uh, racial equity, is that Dr. Lamisha Hill? Uh, in coming to anti-racism or DEI and A work, in which area? And, and who's at the table? Who, who's agreeing upon where the organization is? And furthermore, who's being honest? Because if I'm a person of color who is really fearful and not able to be fully honest and the whole table is saying, I believe that we're a multicultural organization uh, headed toward an anti-racist uh, organization in this particular area, and I feel different, guess what I'm gonna do? When John and Aaron says, what do you think, Dante? Yep, I, I think that we're <laughs> a multicultural organization, right? Uh, because the danger in disagreeing with them is that, oh, he's not a team player. <laughs> Some, he's creating conflict. How many of you have heard those <laughs> before? Problematic uh, attitude. Okay. Um, so it's important to understand, write this down. Who's at the table? What perspective or vantage point are they coming from? In essence, what is informing their assessment or their perspective? And then, in, in understanding um, whose perspectives should matter, Whose perspective should matter in the organizational assessment or evaluation of where the organization is in a particular area? Whose perspective should matter more? 
non-white people, and, and particularly black people, who typically, black people and Latinx people who are typically located at the bottom of organizations as it pertains to uh, whether their perspectives are valued or not, pay, positionality, and so on and so forth. Because if we have the choir, white and white presenting people, or people who are benefiting from uh, racial privilege, saying that, oh, we're headed toward being an anti-racist organization, problem. Turn to your table group and say, that's a problem. That is inherently racist in and of itself. All right, um, any last questions or thoughts before we uh, go to lunch? No, okay. Um, so at lunch, and uh, Eileen is gonna come up and give some instructions prior to us grabbing lunch and then coming back to do the working lunch. Um, and we're gonna get into groups, uh, transition into intact groups or teams, uh, and work to determine which areas you believe that you all should be focused upon and or tackling in regards to your anti-racism or, or, and or racial equity work within your unit. One thing I'll say, and I'm sorry, I'm doing a mouth. I have to thank Dr. Lamisha Hill uh, for being a wonderful partner. We've become friends over these last three years. Um, you are just a stellar person. Um, you are a strong leader. I admire you. You're one of my role models. And I can't thank you enough for the ways in which you have partnered with me to position this work throughout the campus. 